Hi everybody, Dr. Sloan, exam for drugs. They're all wrapped up in one nice, neat little package for you here so you know exactly which drugs to study. And um, this is the these are the topics. I do want to say that um, on a previous version I had on here stroke. We won't be talking about stroke um, on exam four, but you will have it on your final. So I took the two drugs related to stroke out. They are both drugs that you have already learned anyway. So uh, I think on we go here to the next. So when I say shock, you say... That's right, perfusion. You got it. Um, so let's talk about that. So there's some principles of treatment, and I put this sort of, I did this kind of throughout this particular PowerPoint so that you could kind of focus yourselves in on what the key kind of takeaways are for therapy related to these conditions. So the drugs for shock uh, increase or promote perfusion, which you now um, leads to oxygenation of tissues. And um, when you're giving these, you should definitely be um, monitoring heart rate, blood pressure, um, because these drugs are going to have a lot to do with uh, the vascular tone for your um, patient or um, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. And then if hypotensive, drugs with alpha adrenergic activity are used to increase systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure. Also, adrenergic catecholamines, things like dopamine, dobutamine, epi, nor epi, are widely used in patients with low cardiac output that just that, um, persist despite fluid replacement and electrolyte collection. Correction, sorry. So we know that, you know, hopefully we're going to increase cardiac output when we, you know, pump them full of normal saline um, to try to, you know, help with reperfusion. But that might not necessarily work. And so what you need is you need something that's actually going to work on um, the vessels themselves and increase that vascular tone. And so dobutamine is the cardiotonic agent of choice in critically ill patients. And we're going to talk about dobutamine more in a minute here. Um, there is black box warnings. There's several of them on these drugs. Um, but there's a big one regarding tissue damage with the extravasation of epi. So remember, epi is going to cause intense vasoconstriction, um, which if it's given outside into the tissues around those vessels could actually cause um, necrosis and uh, serious problems. So all vasoactive agents really should be given via central line if possible, just to avoid that possibility. So norepinephrine, better known as Levifed, um, this is an adrenergic drug, again, alpha receptor agonist, and it's given IV, and this is a vasopressor, okay? So norepi is given for its vasopressor effect. It will increase blood pressure because it is, it is decreasing the diameter of your vessels, um, which therefore increases blood pressure. So its use is to be used after adequate fluid volume replacement to treat persistent hypotension in severe shock. And that makes sense. You could give a vasopressor, but if you still don't really have anything in your vessels because of shock, again, perfusion problems, it's better to give this after you've given them, a, you know, like a bolus of fluid um, to kind of pump them back up. We call that fluid resuscitation. So we would do fluid resuscitation first, large volume of fluid, maybe, you know, maybe even two IVs if we need to, to get um, as much fluid in as quick, quickly as we can to restore perfusion and then use norepi um, to help with, again, vascular tone. <clears throat> this is the number one doctor recommended vasopressor it is the first choice um, for management of sepsis and septic shock. So just so you know, because in the old days, it used to be dopamine. 
and now it's norepi. There are just better outcomes um, in randomized controlled trials with norepi. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about norepi. Let's talk about epi. We've already talked about epinephrine. We've talked about it um, as it relates to treating anaphylaxis. And again, um, it can be used in shock. Um, it can be used um, for uh, a local anesthetic as well. Sometimes it's mixed with local anesthetic, so they'll mix them together in the same syringe. And by doing that, you're injecting the local anesthetic, say, into a tissue, but you're vasoconstricting, which sort of keeps the drug in the tissues longer, um, makes it more effective in terms of keeping someone numb for a while. So it's an adrenergic agonist, catecholamine, um, and it's given sub-Q or IM. Actually, it can also be given IV. So I don't have that on here, but it can be given IV. Um, and just a warning, we talked about this before, that there are different strengths of epi. And you can see there is a huge difference between one milligram and 0.1 milligram to the tune of a uh, 10, 10 fold increase um, between those two. So <clears throat> you wanna be really careful about um, which one you give. And so now I have this highlighted ratio expressions are prohibited. So you can't say give one to 1,000 epi or one to 10,000 epi, and it shouldn't even be on the box anymore. It should now say one milligram in one mil or 0.1 milligram in one mil. And there is kind of a fun little YouTube video that was made by some medical students um, on how to learn this. So you guys might enjoy that. And um, yeah, this, this particular content is something that I think is important. It's a potential safety issue and so will be testable as all things on this PowerPoint are testable. Side effects of epi is tachycardia, uh, pounding of the heart, irregular heartbeats, anxiety. You know, epinephrine is the classic thing we think of when we think of fight or flight. Um, <clears throat> again, I use running from the scary monster as my analogy for epinephrine, um, or as my analogy for fight or flight. And it's epi that your body, it's a natural catecholamine that your body is going to release um, during that to help you stay alive. So here's the black box warning. So it's for norepi and epi, right? It can cause tissue damage. You want to infuse into a large vein or central line if at all possible. And then don't use in leg veins um, in older folks because they tend to have occlusions in those leg veins. You could end up getting the drug kind of uh, sequestered into one area which could again lead to um, um, a problem with the tissue. And then don't give epi or nor epi with MAOIs, um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. There are certain drugs that are classified as MAOIs um, as it can lead to respiratory depression, cardiac arrhythmias, and acute hypertensive crisis. Dobutamine. Okay, so dobutamine, again, remember, dobutamine is our vasopressor of choice for sepsis and septic shock. Dobutamine is used um, for cases of shock where cardiac output needs to be increased without the need for blood pressure support. So um, it's great. It is a sympathomimetic beta-1 agonist. So remember, beta-1, one, one heart, two lungs, increases the force of myocardial contraction with minimal increase in heart rate. So this is a positive inotrope. It's just going to squeeze that heart, give you nice big squeezes, which is going to really increase um, cardiac output. So you're going to monitor for heart rate, blood pressure, signs of perfusion, um, because you are increasing cardiac output, you should see an improvement for the patient. So color, you know, is their skin pinking up? Temperature, are they warm? Cap refill, less than um, two seconds. So again, um, it, can, it can enhance or worsen hypotension. So again, if somebody's super hypotensive, um, this may not be the right, the, the right drug to give. 
crystalloids, colloids, and blood products. I just lumped these together. These are used in shock for resuscitation. Again, when I say resuscitation, I just mean revival of perfusion. I don't mean revival of the patient necessarily, although you will have to do revival of the patient if you do not get their perfusion um, restored. So crystalloids, these are the standard IV fluids that we know of. And you know that some can be hypotonic, some can be isotonic, some can be hypertonic. Um, but these are the first line of treatment for shock. And usually we use isotonic fluids like normal saline. Um, there's no agreed upon best solution in the literature though. Um, we've used normal saline forever, but um, some, again, randomized controlled trials looking at which crystalloid is best are sort of inconclusive at this point. But they're the first line of fluid treatment and they improve hypovolemia. So um, again, depending on the type of shock that you have, you know, throwing up a bag of normal saline is going to be, you know, a great start. Colloids, on the other hand, are um, non-dissolvable uh, solids or particles that are suspended in a fluid. So like dextran or head of starch. These are great because they expand the circulatory system. They sort of you know, re-pump up your, your um, blood vessels. Um, so they're volume expanders and uh, they also tend to attract fluid from the tissues, which again makes those vessels nice and plump um, and gives them something to, you know, to pump, gives the heart something to pump. And then blood products, um, doing blood products is needed to increase hemoglobin and maximize oxygenation of tissues. Because remember, in shock, we're worried about perfusion. If we don't have perfusion, we don't have oxygenation. Um, and so perhaps the problem is that you have a, you know, like a, a hypovolemic um, shock due to hemorrhage. And so if that's the case, then they need hemoglobin. They need that oxygen carrying molecule replaced. And often we just give uh, red blood cells. Now, milrinone, we haven't talked about milrinone, but I need to put this in here. And there's just a few things I want you to remember about milrinone. Milrinone in general is, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Um, and it's used to manage acute heart failure. Um, I have a friend who works in a heart failure uh, clinic, a heart transplant clinic here in Spokane. And she said, tons of people are on milrinone and they're actually on a milrinone drip. It's kind of the last possible thing they can give this patient to keep them alive until they either get their heart transplant or they pass away from their heart failure. Um, but it's given IV um, and it produces an immediate effect. It's a very positive inotrope. So it increases the force of contraction and it produces systemic and pulmonary vasodilation. So this is a really great drug for someone who is in um, kind of end stage heart failure. But the problem with milrinone is it causes potentially fatal ventricular arrhythmias in 12% of patients. So it is a last ditch drug. It's a, it's a good drug, but it's a last ditch drug. And kind of once patients go on this, um, they tend to go off. Now, if you think about it, so this could be um, a really great drug for um, cardiogenic shock, right? So while the heart's recovering, from whatever kind of you know injury has been sustained, whether it's an MI or whatever, putting somebody on milrinone for a little bit might just sort of give the heart that extra oomph that it needs to pump until it recovers. So in that case, then the patient would hopefully be able to come off milrinone um, once they've recovered from their, their heart attack. But if down the road they develop heart failure or kind of chronic you know heart failure, and have to go back on milrinone, that's when we use it as a last ditch drug. So I hope that's helpful. And milrinone is milrinone. It does not have a brand name. Um, it's generic and its brand are the same. And why that is, I can't tell you. 
Okay, digoxin. <clears throat> you guys have already learned about dig, but let's just talk about it again. So this again would be used in the case of cardiogenic shock because it is a positive inotrope, helps with contraction, and a positive chronotrope, it increases, or sorry, negative chronotrope, it decreases, um, sorry, I need to put that in there, uh, decreases heart rate. So we know it can cause toxicity at high doses. This is a drug with a very narrow therapeutic range. And remember, um, signs and symptoms of having toxic levels of DIG are, uh, you know, halos, visual changes, nausea, vomiting. Um, so it's a drug that if people are on it for a long period of time, you're going to need to do DIG levels on them. It should be given the same time each day. Don't skip a dose. Um, you want to take the pulse for one full minute prior to administering the drug. And if heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, um, then we want to hold off. Uh, and then ensure that potassium levels are adequate, especially, especially the patients taking a loop diuretic as well. So if we're also using a diuretic to help, now we probably aren't going to be using a diuretic um, during shock, but um, it's an important thing to be reminded of with DIG. Um, again, those patients on long-term heart failure, um, many of them are on a loop diuretic. And so that can cause hypokalemia, which then increases the possibility of ditch toxicity. So this is where being the knowledgeable nurse and knowing what to look for and knowing what to monitor for um, is really important. Okay, albuterol. Now we're talking more um, for anaphylactic shock, uh, shock due to anaphylaxis. Um, albuterol, as you know, is a beta-2 agonist. Again, one heart, two lungs, beta-2s. Opens airways, um, causes bronchodilation of the bronchi and the bronchioles. So it's it alone by itself will not do anything for anaphylactic shock. It doesn't change the reaction that the patient's having. This really just treats a symptom of that, which is bronchoconstriction. It's given via nebulizer or inhaler. And just review the side effects from albuterol. We've already talked about them because it's beta 2, but it has some beta um, 1 overflow. You may get some like tachycardia, jitteriness, anxiety, tremors. Um, with albuterol. Benadryl. Okay, so again, Benadryl, it's an H1 receptor antagonist. Um, it's an H1 blocker, histamine blocker. And remember, it's first generation. Does anybody remember what second generation would be? <gasps> it would be like Allegra or um, Zyrtec, one of those, um, Claritin, where um, you have all the benefits of the H1 blockade, but not all the side effects. But Benadryl itself has a lot of side effects. So it blocks histamine release, and it won't be effective against initial anaphylaxis, right? That train's already left the station, but it may prevent the development of full-blown anaphylaxis, meaning that it may prevent the release of additional histamine, um, which would make the patient even sicker. So it is given, but you're probably also going to be giving epi um, or something else that is going to be more potent in terms of dealing with that initial um, reaction. Side effects, you know, these dry mouth, drowsiness, and don't forget that Benadryl, <laughs> the poor parent that uses this to sedate their child for the airplane ride and then finds out that it, it can, it doesn't always, but it can cause paradoxic excitation in children, meaning it's not supposed to cause excitation, it's supposed to cause drowsiness, but in some kids, the paradox is that it can cause excitation and then you have wild child on the airplane for however long your flight is. We've all sat next to them. Someday it'll be your child. Okay, then we have hydrocortisone. Um, this is in our family of corticosteroids, right? And the use is for anaphylactic shock. So again, 
we're using it for the anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive properties that it has. <coughs> Steroids are going to immediately address uh, the inflammation and swelling that occurs um, with anaphylaxis. But as you know, there are many side effects, and I really want you guys to know these. You are going to see steroids over and over and over and over again in your practice. So you need to learn these. So certainly you can have Cushing's disease, um, which is from too much cortisol or, or steroid. Um, and then you can have the cushionoid features that come with it. Now, this, this cushionoid features and Cushing's disease typically are not an issue when you're taking a five-day course. Um, it's when you're on long-term hydrocortisone, so um, long-term prednisone or steroid use. But the cushionoid features are moon face, buffalo hump due to fat redistribution, hyperglycemia, please don't forget that, hyperglycemia is so severe that some patients actually have to go on insulin, thin skin or stretch marks, hypocalcemia, it's dense growth. It can lead to cataracts and glaucoma. And then um, remember, it suppresses the immune system. So you need to watch for fevers. We have this on another test, and many of you missed it. So don't be surprised if it shows its little face again on another test. Um, so think about it. If they're immunosuppressed, what kinds of things will we be looking for in terms of fever, signs and symptoms of infection. Very important. Okay, moving on. Drugs for ADHD, depression, anxiety, psychosis, and bipolar disorder. So remember, major depression, you know, it impairs the ability to function in usual activities. Um, and you can that can be like seasonal affective disorder where people get kind of down because of the gray weather and not enough sunshine. Um, it could be postnatal depression as well, um, postpartum, we tend to call it. Um, and then uh, bipolar disorders and mood disorder with alternating episodes of depression and mania. SSRIs are the first line of treatment for depression due to a favorable side effect profile. So they're really, um, they're used more than something like amitriptyline, which is an old, 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 old drug. We consider that a uh, kind of a typical antidepressant, but has a lot of side effects, so we don't use it. So we use SSRIs, and then if we need to, we can do SNRIs, um, but they have a few more anticholinergic effects, which can be a little bit unpleasant, things like sweating and stuff like that. And then um, serotonin syndrome, remember this can occur especially if somebody is on perhaps two medications um, that increase um, serotonin. So like an SSRI and an SNRI together, which sometimes is done. Um, so high blood pressure, high fever, agitation, seizures, you need to know those four things. Serotonin syndrome. High BP, high fever, agitation, seizures can occur if using combination therapy. And remember, serotonin syndrome can be fatal. So it's something that the nurse has to be watchful for. Hmm, what kind of a test question would that be? Something like, your patient is exhibiting these symptoms. What is the nurse suspicious for? Hmm, okay. Um... More principles of treatment for this group of drugs is increased risk of suicidal ideation in children, adolescents, and young adults um, when taking antidepressants. We've talked about this in class that, you know, a lot of times patients begin to feel better and feel enough motivation to begin to actually have suicidal ideation, um, but that, that should go away as the patient feels better and better. Um, abrupt discontinuation um, of antidepressants can lead in a lead to a um, a flu-like syndrome um, where patients feel really crappy. Um, so we don't want to do any kind of abrupt discontinuation of antidepressants. You want to um, taper up, taper down. 
Lithium is the drug of choice for bipolar disorder, has a narrow therapeutic index, however, hmm, kind of like DIG and other drugs that we've studied, and so drug levels need to be monitored. Um, and in fact, um, on lithium, at a, at a maximum of three months, every three months, so free, more frequently if possible, but um, sorry, I should say at a minimum every three months. And then lithium um, is retained in the absence of sodium, so patients on low sodium diets are at greater risk of toxicity. It's kind of weird because lithium is a metallic salt, and so you would think, well, they have enough salt, but the, it's different. It's sodium um, that we need to worry about, and sodium salt is different than lithium salt. So you need to make sure that um, patients um, are getting a decent amount of sodium in their diet. And then there's many black box warnings uh, for psychiatric drugs, so be careful. I've only pointed them out if it's something that I feel you should know for the test. I think if you work, again, um, with the mental health, um, in a mental health um, facility of some sort, you will become expert at these black box warnings. And then don't forget the drugs take several weeks to work. So when the patient says to you, why am I not feeling better? I've been taking this for three days. You need to say, hey, it doesn't work that fast. You got to hang with it a little bit. Uh, Ritalin. Ritalin is used for ADHD. It's an amphetamine-related drug. It's not amphetamine, but it's like amphetamine. And it's a cortical stimulant that acts on the CNS. It suppresses appetite, elevates mood, and improves physical performance. So, as you well know, this is a banned drug. This is what we consider a uh, performance-enhancing drug. And so um, they test for this in athletes. But it's typically used for ADHD, and it can be used for people with narcolepsy. Um, the adverse effects of Ritalin are uh, just think about being kind of on overdrive, right, in every area of your, of your body, except for um, hematologic. So we'll talk about this. So tachycardia, hypertension, excessive CNS stimulation, you know, think about how you feel, would feel on amphetamines, nervousness, insomnia, convulsions, GI effects, it can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, skin effects, it can cause rash or an exfoliative dermatitis. That just means a a skin inflammation that causes your skin to um, exfoliate or come off. And then um, the interesting thing is uh, hematologic is the only area where it actually has sort of what we would consider, um, you know, kind of a, a decreased effect, right? It causes leukopenia and anemia. And leukopenia is low white blood cells and anemia is low red blood cells. And then the other thing it can cause is anorexia and weight loss, and that kind of goes along with these GI effects as well. Uh, Chlorpromazine hydrochloride, um, and um, we're gonna it, we're not we, we learned about Haldol, but we're gonna use this drug instead. It's similar to Haldol. Um, this is what we call um, a typical antipsychotic, and it's used for schizophrenia. It prevents dopamine and serotonin from occupying receptor sites on uh, the neuronal cell membranes. So um, its use is for schizophrenia, acute mm -hmm. agitation, and bipolar mania. So if you think about that, it's all, again, these kind of hyper-stimulated um, um, states. But the adverse effects can be too much of its intended effect, right? It can cause excessive sedation. Um, this is a drug just like uh, Haldol can cause tardive dyskinesia, fatigue, impaired mobility, impaired mental processes. Um, it can have cardiovascular and hematologic effects. But the other thing is this has tons of interactions with other meds. So if your patient is on chlorpromazine hydrochloride, um, we need to make sure that the other things they're on are okay to take. Okay. 
uh, fluoxetine, Prozac. Uh, Prozac is an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Blocks the reabsorption of serotonin in the brain and elevates mood. It's used for depression and anxiety. The two of those usually tend to go together. So I remember when Prozac came out, it was like miracle drug for depression. Just people were like, oh, this is amazing and incredible. And, and it's, you know, it's a good drug. But there are lots of other good SSRIs as well. Um, this one just happens to be the prototype that we're learning. Um, fewer side effects than chlorpromazine. Please cross that out. That is not true. And um, yeah, just ignore that. So first line of treatment um, for depression is, um, is this drug. Is, fluoxetine or an SSRI. I think what I meant to say here is fewer side effects than uh, amitriptyline. So <clears throat> um, amitriptyline is what was used in the old days for um, depression and we don't really use it anymore because it does have so many side effects. So that's what I meant to say there. Sorry about that. Uh, side effects from Prozac is GI, nausea, diarrhea, weight loss. Some people actually can never, this, these usually improve once you've been on it for a little bit. Um, but sometimes people just are like, uh-uh, I'm not going to take it. I can't do it. Um, so anyway, just know that, just, you can let people know that that will eventually get better. Um, it's just worse when you first take it and your body's getting used to it. And then it can cause sexual dysfunction. And we talked about this. Um, all of the SSRIs and some of the SNRIs can cause this. And it presents as delayed ejaculation in men and impaired orgasmic ability in women. Um, so this makes it um, a challenge for compliance. Some people are like, uh-uh, I'm already depressed. I don't need to have another, you know, issue in my life. Bupropion, bupropion, I always want to put an R in there, prion, it's pion, bupropion, well, butrin. Um, this is a drug that it inhibits the reuptake of dopamine, norepi, and serotonin. Wow, that's a, it's like a three for one right there. You get a three for. Um, it's used for depression. Often given alone, but it can be added to an SSRI. So if someone is not getting great effect from an SSRI, um, they may be put on Wellbutrin as well um, as the SSRI. Um, it's good for seasonal affective disorder, but it is also a drug that is used for smoking cessation. And I know several years ago when patients were being prescribed this for depression, they were having trouble getting it filled at their pharmacies because pharmacies, um, not pharmacies, but pharmacy plans, health plans were saying, hey, we don't pay for smoking cessation um, medications, which makes no sense given how bad smoking is for you. But anyway, we don't pay for those, so you can't have this. And it's like, no, no, not using it for smoking cessation. We're using it for depression. This is considered an atypical antidepressant. Um, it can increase the seizure threshold. So you need to be really careful um, in people with epilepsy. And actually, I should say not increase. It, it can increase the risk of a seizure, which means that it actually decreases the seizure threshold. Sorry about that. So um, which means that the seizure will occur with less provocation uh, while they're on this particular medication. So somebody who has a history of seizures or has epilepsy should not take this drug because it's going to make it too easy for them to have a seizure. CNS stimulant effects like anxiety, excitement, insomnia, restlessness, and it does have a black box warning, especially I believe this is in young adults. It can cause neuropsychiatric reactions. Um, so someone who has never had any kind of a psychiatric issue other than their depression may end up having almost like a psychosis. 
lithium and it's usually lithium carbonate but we only say lithium it is a metallic salt and it is used to control mania um, for those who are um, suffering from a schizophrenic uh, mania episode it's effective for 60 to 80, 65 to 80 percent of patients um, the mechanism of action is really unknown, which is interesting because we have been using lithium for a long, long time. So, um, but it, we know that it affects the synthesis, release, and reuptake of several different neurotransmitters. It is the drug of choice for manic episodes related to bipolar disorder. Doses need to be increased and decreased gradually. This is, again, a drug that you cannot abruptly stop. Um, so you need to kind of work your way up and work your way down and it requires measurement of drug levels. So again, narrow therapeutic index um, and here at a minimum of every three months. So patient teaching, um, the key thing about lithium is um, to not take this with diuretics which cause sodium loss or if you're going to take it with a diuretic that causes sodium loss, working with the physician to figure out how to supplement your diet with more um, sodium. And the reason is, is that um, hyponatremia, low sodium, can lead to lithium toxicity. You also want to have adequate, adequate salt intake, right? Adequate fluid intake. This, because it is a metallic salt, um, can make you thirsty. So drinking plenty of water, um, 8 to 12 glasses a day, um, is good in terms of preventing dehydration. Olanzapine. Um, this is a drug that is used as an atypical antipsychotic. It decreases dopamine activity. Um, it can be used uh, for the mania phase of um, bipolar disorder, and um, it can also be used in combination with an SNRI for depression related to bipolar disorder. It causes something called DRESS, drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, and eosinophilia puts you into almost like a hyper allergic state. So um, I would imagine that the drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms is something akin to like a mild anaphylaxis. Okay, migraine and seizures. We are not covering stroke, so my apologies, but I'm going to talk about it in here anyway. We're going to have this information, stroke information, on the final exam. Migraine seizures are going to be on exam four. But let's just talk about um, the stroke information that's on here, Just, and I'll talk about it again um, as we prepare for the final. But remember, a thrombus is a stationary clot, and an emboli is a clot on the move, right? So pulmonary emboli, um, those are clots that came from somewhere else, usually the, the calf. Uh, clot busters or fibrinolytics can cause serious bleeding. So um, talking about like TPA and uh, prevention of stroke involves treating the underlying conditions that can lead to a stroke. And then vitamin K can reverse the effects of warfarin in the event of a serious bleed. Okay, uh, let's talk about headaches now. So we have, know that there's different types of headaches. The three types that we learned were tension, cluster, and migraine. Uh, the type of headache really determines the treatment. And we should never ever forget our non-pharmacologic uh, considerations or interventions. So things like lifestyle change. Diet may help with migraine or tension headache management, things like getting enough sleep, um, eating good food, uh, avoiding certain foods that might be triggers. Um, combination of aspirin, caffeine, and Tylenol has been used. It's been effective for some people. 
Um, this is what is in Excedrin migraine, if anyone's ever used that. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a great drug for just a regular headache as well. Uh, but it has been shown to be effective for some people for migraine. Ergotamine is not used as much due to side effects. We talked about that in class. And prevention of headache is best. So we know that we can't always prevent them, but things like all the education around avoiding triggers and taking care of oneself, doing things that help um, keep a patient from developing headache um, is the best way to treat this. And then opioids and anti nausea meds are used in addition to headache medications to treat the side effects of severe migraine. I'll tell you what though, if you go to the emergency room and you want opioids and you say that you have a headache, it will be the absolute last thing they give you. Um, so they'll try a million other things before they give opioids um, just because of so many people with drug seeking um, behavior. Now, um, seizures, you, we talked about this, taking seizure meds same time each day, um, is that compliance is key, really keeping blood levels of the drug at as much of a constant as possible is what we're trying to achieve there. And then avoiding triggers for seizures, uh, lack of sleep, uh, visual triggers. Some people actually have visual triggers for a seizure and you'll see it now on a number of TV shows and things where they say, <clears throat> um, you know, warning, this show has, you know, a, a visual trigger that may affect some people with seizures. So anything like a fan that goes around, anything that strobes, lights going on and off. Um, I did hear a great story about a child who had a seizure every day on a school bus and they figured out that the trigger was um, going by a white picket fence every day and just those evenly spaced pickets with the negative you know, space in between was enough to be a sort of a strobing effect and cause this child to have seizures. Low blood sugar. Um, for some people can be a trigger, and then fever. Um, as we talked about, one seizure is not considered epilepsy. So um, kind of everybody gets one. <laughs> Could be for lots of reasons, but about 50% of the people who have one seizure go on to develop a second seizure, and then that is considered um, epilepsy and requires treatment. Treatment is usually lifetime treatment. You may be able to go up or down on your meds, but um, rarely are you able to discontinue medications completely. And then just the implications of seizures and having a seizure disorder really impacts people's day-to-day um, -day lives. I mean, depending on what they do, it could affect their job, it could affect um, their ability to drive, it could affect, um, you know, caring for things. I mean, you think about it, if you have a nurse with a seizure dis disorder, um, that has to be under control. Otherwise, you may not be able to care for someone um, if you have a seizure. So something to consider. Um, one of the meds that's used for um, headaches is uh, naproxen or naproxen sodium. Um, this is what you see in like a leave over the counter. Uh, the, where we really kind of made its debut is for um, cramps related to um, a woman's monthly cycle. Um, but it is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It's an NSAID and it inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. So it's, it's a good pain reliever. It can be used for muscle pains. Um, but it works really well for headache, um, like I said, dysmenorrhea, and fever and inflammation. So <clears throat> good all-around drug, but there are some adverse effects. Um, just like other NSAIDs, it has GI and renal um, issues, so you're at risk for an ulcer or for decreased renal function. 
And some patients with asthma, COPD, might experience um, bronchoconstriction as well. But it works really well in combination with other medications for migraine. I would say on its own for migraine may not be enough, but um, putting it together with other meds can be really effective. Sumatriptan, Imitrex. Um, this is your prototype for 5-HT uh, receptor. Um, it binds to 5-HT receptors and it produces um, vasoconstriction which relieves the pain of a headache. So the pain of a migraine or most headaches is due to vasodilation. If you think about that, it makes sense, right? Vasodilation would increase intracranial pressure and increased intracranial pressure um, causes pain. So um, for an acute migraine, you would take Imitrex. Um, the recommendation is that you take it at the onset of the headache. And then it can be taken again two hours later if the pain is still there or if it has returned, um, but no sooner than two hours before um, you take that second dose. Adverse effects, you can have chest pain. Remember, we talked about it causing um, vasoconstriction, right? Producing vasoconstriction. And it can happen uh, with cardiac. It, it could be transient. But for somebody who has a cardiac history, this should be used with caution. Um, changes, it can cause changes in blood pressure. It can cause, which makes sense because it causes vasoconstriction. Um, it can cause myalgia, which is muscle pains. Um, I know that after my husband used to take Imitrex, his head would feel tender, like you know, jaw around his jaws and on his scalp. And he said even going in and taking a shower it was kind of painful having that water just pound on his scalp. Um, it can cause fatigue. And I think some of the fatigue is also due to the fact that once you've gotten rid of a migraine, you often feel fatigued and tired. Um, it sort of leaves you kind of wrung out. And um, then there's the trip town rush. And I talked about that, that with usually within about 30 minutes of taking the medication, um, a lot of times that vasoconstriction can happen kind of simultaneously. A patient can actually sort of feel it. They kind of get this rushing sensation in their head, but also hopefully the headache begins to go away. Gabapentin, Neurontin. This is a marvelous drug. It is used, I've used it so much with oncology patients for neuropathic pain, um, but it is a really great drug. It can be used for insomnia, um, but it's also used for seizures as well. But I probably have given it the most for pain. So um, it's interesting that it's listed in here for seizures, but it's a great drug and you guys should know about it because it's being used more and more and more and more. Um, it is a GABA analog. It acts like GABA, which is a oh, glutamic amino butyric acid, I believe. Um, GABA is a um, it is an excitatory, uh, sorry, an inhibitory um, neurotransmitter. So um, so having this GABA analog sort of calms the brain down, kind of tells it to chill out a little bit. And it makes sense that if that's what it does, that it would also work for insomnia. Um, adverse effects for GABA is CNS depression. <laughs> Might be why it works for insomnia. Uh, dry skin, itchiness, but it can also lead to suicidal ideation. So you got to watch it if you're going to give it to your patients. Our old friend lorazepam, Ativan, we've talked about diazepam as well. Um, these are benzodiazepines and they increase the effects of GABA, right? So if it's increasing GABA, it's increasing the neuroinhibitory effect, um, meaning again, kind of calms the brain down. So uses are for seizure and anxiety. Um, <laughs> I used it once. I gave it to a kid once after putting in an NG tube. This kid was freaking out because of the NG tube and how it felt. We had to give him huge amounts of um, 
uh, of Go Lightly because we needed to kind of clean him out for a GI procedure he was going to have. And he was just flipping out. As soon as I gave him the Ativan, he was like, oh, this tube is no problem. It's fine. It doesn't bug me at all. So, I mean, it is a pretty great drug, but you do have to watch your patients. Um, diazepam, which is in the same family of drugs, is tends to be used more for seizures. So I just want to put that in here. It's used more frequently than Ativan or Lorazepam. So I just, I just want to say that you'll often see um, a drug even called um, diastat, which is rectal valium and can be given during a seizure. Um, it's a really good drug for status epilepticus. And because they fall into the same family, they have the same side effects. So disorientation, confusion, it can cause sedation. Normally, these drugs do not cause respiratory depression, but if you give, especially diazepam, you give it too fast, IV push, you can cause respiratory arrest. Just for a minute, they, I mean, they'll come right back, but you really don't want to do that. So be really careful when you give, um, especially diazepam, that you're careful about respiratory arrest. I really have given a lot of lorazepam um, in my day. We used to use it a lot for nausea and vomiting before we had Zofran. And um, it does cause a lot of sedation, but I never had trouble with respiratory um, suppression or depression. Phenytoin. Phenytoin is dilantin. Um, it is a high dantoin is the kind of drug class that it is. It stabilizes the neuronal membrane by delaying the influx of sodium into the neurons, and that prevents excitability caused by excessive stimulation. Um, so this is a very common, used to be really the only anti-seizure drug that we had in the day. Um, it's used for, you know, major seizures, tonic-clonic, and it's also preventative for patients undergoing brain surgery or post-brain surgery. Um, so, you know, if you're going to have brain surgery, you may get this as sort of a prophylactic almost so that you, there is no seizure. And the big adverse effects with this is gingival hyperplasia with that picture in our PowerPoint from class, just crazy amount of, um, uh, gingival, um, overgrowth. And it also interacts with a ton of meds. And then Lamictal, Lamotrigine, and um, this is being used a lot more for seizures. It is a uh, phenyltriazine derivative. Its mechanism of action is really not very well understood, but it's thought to reduce the release of glutamate. Um, it's used along with other meds for treatment of partial seizures, but it is also used for bipolar disorder. I happened to meet a lady who goes to my church who we were working in the nursery, and she told me that um, going on Lamotrigine had really changed her life um, in a lot of ways, that she had bipolar disorder, had really had struggled with lithium, um, and ended up going on uh Lamotrigine and just really made things so much better. Um, she'd never been able to have like a boyfriend. She'd had trouble keeping a job. And once she had gone on this med, um, she was able to do both of those things. So, um, so it's good, but it is also used for seizures. And um, again, adverse effects, loads of um, drug interactions, and this can cause visual changes like visual side effects so we have to watch it when we're giving it to the patient it might be that the patient can't tolerate it due to those side effects Ooh, one of our old friends methylprednisolone okay so we did hydrocortisone and methylprednisolone all right so uh, this is used to treat um, general inflammation and swelling. And since we talked a little bit about spinal cord injury, um, although that's not really a part of our particular um, um, 
we're not talking about that for this exam. Um, it's this drug is in here, so um, it, it works well for that. Um, methylprednisolone, though, is used for so many um, different different things. So um, again, you don't really need to know this for this particular um, test. I won't test you on methylprednisolone, but you already know it, so we don't really have to worry about that. Okay, guys, that's it. I'm sorry, long-winded, blah, blah, blah. I hope it was helpful. Um, yeah, all right. I'll talk to you on Sunday.